Today, you or I are gonna do something a little different. Due to part of the reason being that I'm traveling and don't have the opportunity to go into an in-depth research article, per se. However, though, there have been three fascinating research articles that came out within the past few weeks, which seem to go under the radar of many of our popular media channels, yet they are so worthy of note, so fascinating, so groundbreaking, so counterintuitive, and I have to say, a little disturbing, that basically they need attention brought to them. And so this week, let us begin with these particular three articles of note. So the first one right off the bat, recall the experiences surrounding death more than hallucinations. And I'm talking this is a huge collaborative global team that worked on this particular research. And by the way, as well, these are all peer reviewed research articles, uh, which are published publicly in, I should say, renowned journals. Next, link between high cholesterol and heart disease inconsistent. You think that would have made a little bit of the TV news, but au contraire, it did not. Then after that, one which is, doesn't sit well, but however though, it needs to be addressed. All because we may not be happy with the outcome of the particular study does not mean we shouldn't look into it, hopefully to potentially find a better way of doing something. As we note, EMFs, electromagnetic fields, calcium and Alzheimer's disease, a closer link. And this means primarily a stronger correlation, although be it correlation is not causation, still just the same. Also as well, there'll be links to these particular articles under the YouTube channel. So basically you could follow it on your own and make your own judgments or hypothesis on your own personal experience or knowledge base. I'm just gonna read the highlights to you to bring attention, deservedly so, and you take it from there. So I hope you enjoy. To begin, recall the experiences surrounding death more than hallucinations. Right off the bat, often our biases will go, this is trying to prove life after death. What they are primarily doing is saying, hey, although other researchers may have the hypothesis that near death experiences are more, or just basically no more than just hallucinations, the data that they expose does not support that argument. Something more is there. And the researchers are careful not to add publisher bias, I should say, or further bias it by additional confounding. All they are out there to do is say, hey, these near-death experiences are not just hallucinations, something else is there. So let us begin. Recall the experiences around death more than hallucinations. We're just gonna take a few of the highlights just to basically grab your attention. And from there, you basically work with your own hypothesis. To begin, the first one. The recalled experiences surrounding death are not consistent with hallucinations, illusions, or psychedelic drug-induced experiences. According to the several previously published papers, instead they follow a specific narrative arc involving a perception, A, a separation from the body with a heightened vast sense of consciousness and recognition of death, B, travel to a destination, C, a meaningful purpose, review of life involving critical analysis of all actions, intentions, and thoughts towards others, a perception of D, being in a place like home, and E, a return back to life, otherwise it would not be a near-death experience. And then, from the biological aspect, and we look at it here, basically showing, studies showing the emergence of gamma activity and electrical spikes are ordinarily assigned of heightened states of consciousness on an EEG in relation to death further support the claims that millions of people have reported experience of lucidity and heightened consciousness in relation to death. To conclude the article, and I want you to take a special note too, towards the bottom of all the individuals that worked on this project. And did you hear about it in the news? Maybe it's not a popular thought to say, hey, there may be something more. But in any case, these researchers did do their homework and said, hey, your assumptions, your hunches may be accurate. There may be something more there. 
But without further ado, to conclude, so far, the researchers say evidence suggests that neither physiological nor cognitive processes end with death. That is an incredibly strong statement. They're not trying to draw a hypothesis why. They're just saying that is not a black and white issue in regard to saying life, death, da da. There's so much more that still needs to be understood that they're oversimplifying exactly what consciousness is. And that's what science is alluded to. And that although systematic studies have not been able to absolutely prove the reality or meaning of patients' experiences or claims of awareness in relation to death, it has been impossible to disclaim them either. That's what you want to take away. If from there, use your skill set, knowledge base, experiences, and you build upon that hypothesis, and the links will be there for you to follow as well. But that is a really awesome study. Awesome. Uh, that just somehow, where to go? You know what I mean? Again, it's look at the number of people that worked in this global study. Some of the best research out there doesn't necessarily make it to the news pool, as well as the next one. Now, often I don't go negative, and this is not about being negative. All right, this is just about saying, hey, the correlation that was drawn prior with further technology and research doesn't appear to be as strong. And this is important because a lot of individuals take medications in reference to this particular aspect, uh, which you would think would have drawn a little bit more attention as well. But let us proceed. Link between high cholesterol and heart disease inconsistent new study finds. Where is this published? In the Journal of American Medical Association. The research questions the efficacy of statins when prescribed with the aim of lowering LDL, there C, and therefore reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. Previous research has suggested that using statins to lower LDL C positively affects health outcomes that we've all heard many, many times to ad nauseum. And this is reflected in various iterations, iterations mean to repeat over and over again, and expert guidelines for prevention of CVD. Statins are now commonly prescribed by doctors with one third, and this of course you can tell this was done, of Irish adults over the age of 50 taking statins. According to previous research, the new finding to highlight this one aspect the new finding contradicts this theory. Number of people being affected by the consumption of statins. And then you have a new finding like this, finding that this relationship was not as strong as previously thought. Instead, the research demonstrates that lowering LDL-C using statins had an inconsistent and inconclusive impact on cardiovascular disease outcomes such as myocardial infarction, st stoke, stroke, even the best of us make, uh, I guess, spelling errors, stoke, and all cause mortality. In addition, it indicates that the overall benefit of taking statins may be small and will vary depending on an individual's personal risk factors. Again, the link will be there for you to travel on to your own, form your own hypothesis, and if necessary, review with a medical professional, if you are not already one. Then, next one. This one makes me feel uncomfortable, and obviously it's gonna make a lot of us feel uncomfortable because it's your cell phone or it's your Wi-Fi. And keep in mind, many of these articles don't come out to discount this as some sort of paranoia or fear of new technology. All it really may be indicating is, hey, we recognize this deficit of this technology now Let's be adults about it, recognize the deficit or the challenge, and overcome it. So, to proceed as follows. EMFs, calcium and Alzheimer's disease, a closer link. Right off the bat, you're going to see one and two, and that's going to go into basically more of the technical aspects of why this occurs. But, I'm going to read the two paragraphs right after it called EMFs and calcium buildup. Pulse electronically generated electromagnetic fields, EMFs, used for wireless communication are coherent, producing strong electric and magnetic forces that act in the cells of our bodies, primarily 
via activation of voltage-gated calcium channels, VGCC. Activation produces rapid increases in intracellular calcium levels. Therefore, EMF exposure produces changes, another spelling error, with lead, I already think with lead, which lead to excessive intracellular calcium. This buildup explains the effects on the brain in Alzheimer's disease. These EMF-induced changes to intracellular calcium levels have been demonstrated in animal models of Alzheimer's disease. Research has shown that the involvement of the two pathways that lead to Alzheimer's disease, I could have read that better. Each of these two pathways produces pathophysiological effects following EMF exposure and are important in Alzheimer's causation. Keep in mind, now the word correlation is offset and the word causation overtakes to proceed. The excessive calcium signaling pathways and the peroxynitrate oxidative stress inflammation pathway. Now it's going to get good. Now you have to keep in mind, people are going to go, hey, you know what? These are animal models. Animal models aren't human models. Now you tell me how you can construct a human trial using pulse electromagnetic fields without breaching some sort of ethical covenant. It's kind of saying, hey, you know, if we have a trial for you, we want to see how many brain cells we can kill off in a certain period of time, or if it even happens at all, use impulse EMF waves. Yeah, try getting funding for that trial. To proceed, the age of onset of Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease has decreased over the past 20 years or so. Now, a lot of that could be dietary, lack of activity, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of strong correlations and confounding that could play a role. But still, that does not distract or detract from basically the mechanism of actions of the EMF to proceed. With timing corresponding to large recent increases in wireless communications and EMF exposures, recent studies report age 30 to 40, Alzheimer's cases start appearing. Very young people who are exposed to cell phone or Wi-Fi radiation for many hours per day, which now, who doesn't? especially with all the lockdowns and stay home orders and things that over the past two years, what happened? We vastly increased our EMF and wireless exposure. Think about that. For many hours per day, many develop digital dementia. And you think about correlation in reference to basically pandemics and certain negative outcomes in regard to disease effects, what's long, what's not. Maybe it's been sitting home next to the Wi-Fi router for too long. Modem, whatever. Here it goes. Now, here's the animal studies from 2008, which the author is alluding to. Showed that two hours per day of very low intensity mobile phone base station cell phone tower radiation produced massive neurodegeneration of the brains of young rats. I'm curious, how many people out there have uh, cell phone towers next to their um, public or private school? Something to think about. 34%, think about this, 34% of brain cells died in four weeks. So to reiterate again, show that two hours per day, two hours, low intensity, mobile phone, base station, cell phone tower, radiation produced massive neurodegeneration of the brain cells of young rats. 34% of the brain cells died in four weeks. 11 measured brain changes and four observed behavioral changes were also greatly lowered by the VGCC calcium channel blocker, um, amiodipin, amiodipin, dipin, dipin. These findings show that EMFs most of us are exposed to to every day act via VGCC activation to produce universal, massive, extraordinarily rapid neurodegeneration in young rats. The researchers did not examine any Alzheimer's specific brain changes. But again, you use a very flowery language, which often is not incorporated into scientific literature. When you start reading massive, extraordinarily rapid neurodegeneration, you're talking four weeks, basically close to, you know, 34% of the brain cells of young mice. Does that correlate to individuals? And people go, well, it's mice. Well, where else do we do most of our medical studies until we carry out to human trials? And back to the caveat, or I should say, uh, 
the catch 22, how do you conduct a human trial in reference to the EMFs like this in young children to proceed. However, they also looked at EMF pulses in rats, found Alzheimer's specific changes, but also some less specific changes in the hippocampus, a brain region which is heavily impacted in Alzheimer's. In 2013, exposed rats to a series of EMF pulses in one day to two month old rats, finding apparent universal Alzheimer's effects in 20 month old rats, roughly the equivalent of a 42 year old human, 42 year old human, coming down with near universal Alzheimer's. The 2016 paper exposed the rats to EMF pulses once a day, causing Alzheimer's at 10 months of age, similar to a 21 year old person, people, with extremely early onset Alzheimer's. Both El Swefi and Jiang found massive, once again, very, very descriptive language. Massive neurodegeneration in young rats simply from exposing them to EMF pulses. And that pretty much wraps it up. That gives you an idea of three incredibly profound, whether you like the outcome of the research or what the research covered or not. It basically, they still address issues or questions. Uh, they open our mind to new ideas or new challenges. And I really, really like doing these research articles. If you like me to do more of this too, every once in a week or once in a week, once a week, or every once in a while, uh, just let me know and I'll do them. But again, it's not about uh, basically targeting necessarily a nutraceutical herb or vitamin, which we can use to improve our daily lives. And I'll continue doing those. But I really, really love science and clinical trials even when the results themselves tend to be controversial uh, in reference to the outcome. Remember, back in May of 2020, when we presented the first study from Monash University in reference to a drug for river blindness, albeit we call ivermectin, and all we did was say this medication eradicated this type of cell in a petri dish, and we had the dubious honor of being one of the first individuals censored on a major media platform. But after that, they're pretty cool about it. But still just the same, once you make knowledge forbidden, that makes it seductive. Once you make knowledge seductive, you basically create a whole train wreck of problems. Again, if they would have just let the scientific debate continue on ivermectin, regardless of the outcome, or having them trying to protect society, maybe we have a much more open discussion as opposed to trying to make something so forbidding. Again, Ralph signing off. Gratitude to all the researchers out there in the articles. Very brave research, incredible research. And again, as always, I am very happy to watch. Catch you next time. Bye.